Welcome to the Unknown Options, the place where we explore the unknown options, the number one source for career apprehension and accessibility. My name is Will, and today I'm with me, Dr. Lewis. Dr. Lewis, it's great to have you here. Could you want to run down on who you are and what you do? Hey, no, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I've seen this podcast a while, so I'm excited to be on it. Um, Dr. Lewis, <laughs> it's a funny title, um, but a doctor of occupational therapy, so... Uh, we really look at people holistically and how we can help them be as independent and um, in the environment that I work in as safe as possible. Um, I work in the acute care setting um, in a hospital. So I work in a lot of the ICUs, the step-down ICUs and the floors. Um, so really how we can help people um, be safe with their everyday activities. Nice. I love it. I love it. We want to we explore your journey, the good, the bad, and the ugly. When did Dr. Lewis, when did you get started uh, on this journey? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I appreciate it. It's just like I was telling you earlier, like an imposter yeah. syndrome, but um, we paid for it. So here we are. Um, so my journey started, um, I always knew that I wanted to work with people. I love people so much. I just didn't know what capacity I wanted to work with them in. Um, so during undergrad, um, I went to school at Virginia Tech and they had a human development program. Um, and I had gotten an email like, oh, if you want to work with people and help people, then do this. So like through there, um, kind of like networking in a sense, had no idea what occupational therapy is. Um, and I've realized very quickly, neither do a lot of people. Um, so that's why it's fun to be able to like advocate a little bit on, um, what we do and who we get to help. Um, right. But I heard about occupational therapy and um, I obviously like medicine is kind of what a lot of people I think think of when we first think of like, how can we help people? Um, and don't get me wrong. I think medicine is great um, to a certain extent, but I believe in holistic medicine and what we can do for ourselves. I believe in empowering people um, and that if we can help ourselves be as independent as possible, um, look at social determinants of health is a passion of mine. Um, that we can be um, even more successful than some medication can help us be, um, if that makes sense. I know I'm yeah. kind of, I can go on a tangent about that. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I found my passion for occupational therapy. My, I have had family members that I've been like taking care of. My grandpa at the time um, had dementia. And so I kind of got to see um, the great skills that OT can really bring in to help for like memory and things like that and apply it. Um, and then had um, a school close to home and right outside of Charlotte okay. open up a um, doctorate program. So I got to stay home, but also um, help my grandparents at the same time. So it kind of everything really fell into place. I really feel like uh, God really has a plan and um, that the fact that that opened at the time that I was home uh, and then through there learned a lot about like more community health and kind of just went for there. I'm still learning. Um, but okay. we're, we're, we started, so. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Tell, tell us your path. I mean, you obviously have, you obviously have your doctorate. Uh, tell us your <laughs> path from like high school to college. And I'm like, did you always want to be a doctor? And we, we know how you decided on that specific path, but like, tell us your path. We know it was a grind. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, I mean, like, I was always that kid, like, that would just, like, clown with my parents and be like, oh, one day I'm going to call me doctor. Like, did I ever think it was really going to happen? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it just so happened that um, at the time um, when I had found out, like, OT was, like, something that I was, like, really interested in and what really wanted to do with my life, um, that they were starting to, like, require doctorates. It got extended since then, since COVID. Um, but the program that had opened closest to me was a doctorate program. Um, the doctorate program also gave me the opportunity to do a capstone, which is kind of like a hands-on um, OT program within school, but then also really ties in the research component. Um, and that's something that I'm hoping to get more involved in. Um, and so I was just, like I said, God has a plan. So I was blessed enough that that program opened and, um, from there was able to kind of like find myself because OT is like very broad. Like I said, it's helping people find their independence and that can be anything in any setting, um, which is also the cool part, but also the overwhelming part. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm still finding who I am within OT. Okay. Um, I'm in the hospital system now, uh, which I never ever <laughs> thought I'd see myself in. <laughs> and it, it's, it's very hard, um, but I really like it. It's a challenge. Um, and I, 
I really appreciate things that challenge me. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I mean, I think that there's a reason for everything. So yeah. I got this job offer, everything lined up as far as when I was moving, my church started actually in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of just like made sense. Um, nice. and the people that I've met have been incredible. Um, do I think this is where my OT journey is stopping? No, <laughs> I think it's just starting here. I think nice. that I'm just, um, I had the privilege of learning so much in the environment that I'm in that I'm excited to apply that to wherever I take OT next. I love it. Why, why did you think that you would never end up in a hospital, in a hospital setting? Because well, the hospital is so depressing. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. And it's, I, I, which, it's funny because like I was like, no, I'm never gonna do the hospital. And it's honestly because like my passions in prison reform mm -hmm. um and addressing like social determinants of health and like how we can really help people in underserved communities thrive. Mm -hmm. It's just access to equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um in a very, very nutshell. Um yeah. but um I think too it's just like it's a little overwhelming and like my program wasn't as focused on like pharmacology and stuff. Um, and never, so with a doctor, we have our two, we have like two clinical rotations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did one in like at Duke pediatrics and then I did, uh, Chapel Hill for inpatient rehab. So I never was in the mm -hmm. acute setting. Um, which I, I realize I'm saying like acute, are we, are we, is acute kind of like a, you know I would, I, mean? I would, I would, uh, I think I understand cause I, I worked for Atrium very briefly, like there you go six years yeah. ago so i think i understand it but if you could explain it for us very quickly because we obviously yeah know, for like, sure absolutely <laughs> um so acute is like imagine that well i guess it's kind of morbid but okay so i work in inner city baltimore so okay. we see a lot of overdoses we see a lot of gunshot wounds a mm. bunch of stuff like that yeah. so you go to the icu ventilator so we can see you there like day one that you come in we're working mm. on setting you up um cognitive um well, coma stem, we call it, but mm -hmm. cognitive stimulation, um, getting your brain working, um, neuro reeducation, um, especially after like a stroke. So it's very like the front line. Like we see you as soon as you come into the hospital, no matter how traumatic, or it could be you're having like liver failure and we're helping you get stronger for a transplant, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then either there's different ways that you can progress from there. So you can either go home, you can go to what's called a subacute rehab, where it's like you continue to get rehab, um, about like an hour a day, um, to get better. Or there's inpatient rehab, which I was doing at Chapel Hill. And that's where you get three hours of rehab a day just to get better before you go home. Yeah, um, so. and then of course there's like hospice and palliative and things like that. Um, yeah. so it's really intense. There's a lot yeah. of, um, it's it's hard it's um heavy i think is a good word mm -hmm. um because don't get me wrong there's a lot of fantastic moments that i'm very thankful for yeah. um and people that make it out of insane situations yeah. but there's also people that come in okay and then they pass and it's mm -hmm. kind of like oh okay yeah, um that's tough and i really love people so i think that's been an adjustment but mm -hmm. um yeah i think the hospital too there's a lot of things I would like to change about the hospital. I know a lot of people that work in the hospital or even don't are like, there's so many things wrong with our healthcare system in the U S. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I must feel a part of it in a way, but I'm hoping that like I can continue to educate myself and learn stories of patients in order to help. Even if it's in the, the smallest way, like I'm big on, you might not change um, the world, but you can change one person's world. So even if I help that one person manage or navigate through the hospital system, um, even if they can't afford it, if, um, you know, they're so medically uh, unstable or don't have the support that they, they feel the love and the support and like have the resources needed. Um, so I think that's kind of why I had, I like hesitate with the hospital system is there's so much politics in it in a way, but I'm just thankful for the people that I get to meet on a one-to-one -one basis. So. What's What's one thing you would change about the hospital system? And oh why? my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> or just no, oh. not even the hospital. Just like I guess the healthcare system as a whole. Oh my gosh! One thing. Where do I start? I don't know why my brain is going to this immediately because there's so many different things as far as like insurance and what they'll cover and not and access to their medication that they need literally to live and you mm -hmm. can't because what you can't afford a house like yeah. what that makes you <laughs> any less of a human it's disgusting yeah. um 
but the one thing that really comes to mind because I'm like I said like really passionate about like holistic medicine Mm -hmm. um is the sleep and like I know it's reasonable for some people but like I just feel like the hospital we preach 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 like oh you need your sleep you need to eat healthy you need to do this or Mm -hmm. you need to be active but then it's like we're not getting them out of bed enough we're not letting you sleep through the night we're offering you cheeseburgers and fried chicken, even though you're in heart failure. And you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's kind of like, okay, like, yeah. let's be a little smarter about it. And like the education piece. And I think that it would be really cool to be able to like follow people through the continuum of care. So it's mm. like when you leave the hospital, okay, great. But can you manage your diabetes? Like now you're a paraplegic, like, can you navigate around your community mm. or do you have the resources to do that? And like, our, we have great case management staff and like we try to but I feel like people get lost or like yeah. under the radar and it's not really feasible and like I don't have the answers but um I think that's I think that's partially like God put me in this position is to like really navigate and like learn about the mm-hmm. hospital system so that I can find out like how I can be an asset system definitely Definitely, you can only you can only work on problems that you can work on. <laughs> like you, know, you can't. And it's so overwhelming because I was like, I want to change everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I had that problem too. I wanted to not. I mean, not, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but I had that. I had that thought at one point. Like I wanted yeah. to fix all the world's problems, but I mean, the when you when you when you really like drill down and you learn that you can only solve like smaller problems, you actually become more yeah. helpful. And then, like, it's it's more realistic, right? And I mean, you might be able to solve yeah. a huge problem one day, but it's like, you, like you said, you learn that, get that knowledge, then you accumulate knowledge, then you find solutions, and you implement solutions, then you hopefully yeah. solve something. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's I'm really glad that you worded it like that. That was good because I think, like, the way that you said it, because I I think that personally, like, in the stage of life that I am now, I've been overwhelmed because I'm mm. like, because like I said, my passion's prison reform. I'm like. Okay, but that could be so many. It's like, do you start in childhood? Do you start with a prison system? Do you start Mm -hmm. with community reentry? And it's like so overwhelming. But like, like I like what you said, where it's like you have to find those small problems, and you have to see how you can benefit people. And I think that I almost have like this guilt or like this um, imposter syndrome where I'm not educated enough. So I Mm -hmm. always feel like I have to continue to learn, learn, learn. But I think that if we just like lead with like good intentions and like good heart like at the end of the day like we can make more of a difference than we realize so it's more just like the confidence and i feel like trusting in ourselves definitely i agree i agree give us give us dr lewis's date obviously like i know your day-to-day probably fluctuates (laughs) vastly every day but like give us like your your give give us your day-to-day i guess if you can i know it's it's probably yeah no 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 absolutely um so i I guess like, okay, so I'm with a hospital system, um, Johns Hopkins that like really values and like, don't get like, honestly, like I've worked in a few hospitals and like, they're great, but like, I have really seen firsthand how like Johns Hopkins really is like, we don't want to just do the same thing because it's work. We want to see what the research is saying and we want to implement it. Like they're in the middle of like changing our entire system right now, just because of research and how we can be better for our patients. And I think that's great. So like it does change vastly and I'm very thankful for that. So recently they've um, changed their onboarding system. So I started in October. So I've been there seven months. I don't know. Math isn't mathing that quick, but (laughs) I want to say like seven ish months, six, seven, I don't know. Um, It feels a lot shorter than that, but they had the onboarding system where the first like um, year, basically, like they're just taking you through every ICU, every floor, every step down ICU and training you. Um, So now I'm in the advanced ICU part. So I have like quizzes and exams that I have to do uh, and then I'm checked off on it. Um, And then in addition to that, like my daily when I walk in. It's we do rounds, so we find like our priority patients, our priority evaluations, who just came in, um, who needs our services, talking to providers, the nurses, um, and then from there. So okay, so we have it based on teams. Some of them, the uh, general medicine team. Okay. Um, so we can be floated to other teams because we are trained on every team. Mm-hmm. Um, but because I'm on general medicine, we see really everything, and we mm-hmm. see a lot of like the social issues as well um which is hard but it's almost like why i like it because i'm like this is just reminding me like what my motivation is behind 
system and like reform things like yeah. that. Um, so based on the needs, we'd identify the patients that we're going to see that day. Um, and then chart review, talk with the team, treat them. Um, so a lot of what I look like or look at in the acute setting is, Hey, like, like, I don't know. Let's see. You had your leg amputated. Like, how do you get to the bathroom, brush your teeth, shower, dress? How are you a father to your children? Like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you navigate in your community? How do you get anything that helps you be independent? And it's it's crazy because, like, I mean, we have patients that have been there months and months and months. We have people that have been there two days. But yeah. it's those patients that are like, I haven't brushed my teeth in five days. Mm. You brush their teeth? When I tell you, they are a different person. <laughs> I'm weird. So, but it's those little things that you take for granted every day that is yeah. like, you no longer have an arm. How do you do it? How do you mm. cut meals for your kids? It's little things like that. And like, yeah. that's what OT, like people are like, all you do is brush teeth. But it's like, but if you haven't done that and you don't have the arms to do it anymore, or you're, yeah. you had a stroke and like, you are not able, like, there's so many little things that it's like those little things we take for granted. If you're yeah. able to do it after an injury, you can change a person. I'm telling you. Definitely. Um, so Basically, our sessions focus on that. We start, when we see a patient for the first time, we start with an evaluation and address what is important to them. Mm. Um, and that's something I really like about the profession because it's like, it's so person-centered, client-centered, where it's mm. like, how can we help you? Like, mm. if if going to the movies is important to you, how do we navigate getting you there, getting in a car, purchasing those tickets? Like, if you have low vision, like, there's so many different aspects. So we get to know the person, their deficits. Um, their strengths and then how we can play on those to really help them continue to be as independent as possible. Um, so we look at a lot of technology equipment um, to go from there. And then we make goals. So we work on those goals every time that we see them um, and then eventually make a discharge plan with the team based on their medical stance um, and how they're doing this. Okay. I love it. And their I support at home. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I actually learned a little bit about, um, OT because my dad had a stroke, so I've oh, I, wow. I met a lot of different uh, like doctors. I mean, I've met a lot of different people like through his journey through the uh, healthcare system. Yeah. So I really appreciate what you guys do, and and that's a great description of what of what your like day to day could look like. Um, now we're gonna move on to the not so speed rounds. I'm gonna turn up the tone a little bit. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's gonna be uh, the first question. It's gonna be like like obviously a speed round. Um, the first question is what is what are passionate creative holistic <laughs> um ooh, i don't know why that fourth one's getting me just um elaborate on why passion's important to become a doctor and like i kind of think i feel like i mean that in a passion for people because if you're not passionate about people and understanding who they are you're not going to serve them i feel like it's easy to go in with your mindset and be like hey this is what we do like get it done yeah but if you're not passionate about learning and like loving them for them then they're mm. never gonna thrive mm, love it that makes sense okay people maybe first. love is another i feel like i feel like love's got to be in everything <laughs> yeah no nah, it's valid that's definitely valid yeah. like this love is missing from a lot of i guess careers <laughs> and professions Absolutely. and it's so it, like i think that's too why i was hesitant about the hospital system because mm -hmm. it's overbearing and it's just like a cycle of people 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 and you come become yeah. desensitized yeah. um and you have to remind yourself like if this was my dad or if this was my grandfather or mom or sister yeah. that like this was me like yeah. how would i want to be treated so that yeah. passion comes there empathetic that's my fourth word <laughs> okay yeah i like that yeah it makes sense yeah it's, it's a, you made a good point there uh my dad saw like a cardiologist a few a few weeks ago and my mom yeah. was really happy because a dude like he said this is the doctor not dude sorry <laughs> sorry dr uh, miller <laughs> he was like the doctor was like i want to treat my dad's name is prince i'm gonna treat prince how i would treat my own brother that's what he said on the call so like my mom was really happy about that because she was like he's like he's He's showing like passion, like empathy, like you said, uh, to another person. So I'm like, who's in like a lower position than him? Um, okay, I but love that's that. that's huge because I feel like that even plays such a big part in the recovery because yeah. it's like, I, it's like I was talking about earlier that like white coat syndrome, like where it's yeah. like, oh, like you feel like you can't talk to like, I think that's super, like we're all people, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like there's a lot of things I don't understand about people that come in. Like my patients, I'm like, wow, that's incredible what you do. Yeah. But I think that it's so big to be on the same page as people and like treat others how you would want to be treated because that helps so much in your healing and like your peace of mind. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. rather than there's I'm telling you what to do and you have to do it or you're gonna die. Like yeah. it's just corny. <laughs> like that's yeah, so dramatic. Yeah, yeah. That's, crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. But I've heard it. Like I've yeah. heard it where it's like oh, I'm the doctor, but I'm yeah. not the person going through this. So like I also don't know what you're feeling and like mm. your circumstances at home. Like I yeah. know you based on a 20 minute conversation. Yeah, makes sense. So. Yeah, you're right. Okay. What <laughs> what what does a world look like without doctors of occupational therapy? Ooh. Um a lot less well, successful, that's a little dramatic. Um <laughs> but I feel like less independent, like I feel like and I mean it depends on your culture too. If mm-hmm. your culture is where it's like someone suffering and hey, it's it's up to us to take care of them, great, that's awesome. Yeah. But I feel like in my experience in um, the American culture has been like we want to do for ourselves. Mm. Um, so the whole point of OT is to empower people um, yeah. and bring that independence. So um, I don't want to say less independent because I don't want to like be like without us everybody's screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's true, it's true, right? <laughs> but, but that's yeah. our goal. So I would like to think that. That is what we give to the world. So, um, what, are, what what's the good, the bad, and the ugly about being a doctor? Mm, the good, I feel like, is just those personal relationships that you make. Because I, like I said, like a million times now, like I really value those people and like being able to see, see the success or like like your dad, like after having a stroke, it's not just it is about the patient, but it's about their family and yeah. who they can continue to be for them. Um, and seeing yeah. the success is great. Um, the bad, which I've been <laughs> been seeing a lot lately, which is sad, like, especially, like, within the acute system mm. um, and, like, at the hospital I'm at, we get a lot of very, like, tough cases, like, mm. which, th- thankfully, like, I've been able to learn a lot and there's been a lot of success, but yeah. there's also not success. There's also heartbreak and it's not just mm. for the patient, but it's for their family because sometimes the patient's ready to go and mm. the family's like, I can't. And I'm yeah. like, if I was in your position, I'd be the same way. And yeah. it's like, how do you comfort somebody like that? You know? Yeah. yeah. And then it's just, I feel like that's most the bad part is like, from the patient perspective, that, but from the therapist perspective, um, is like, it's how do we take on those emotions and be as empathetic as possible, but while also protecting ourselves and being able to be there, like, completely for everyone. Like that. So I feel like that's the bad part is that, like, it's hard to give yourself to everyone while remaining yourself. Mm, that's good. That's a good quote. It might be quoted a year, 2024. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. It, it like came that. out right. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's hard in that way because it's it's not only to the patient, but just to their family and their loved ones or, like, whatever their family looks like, even if it's not blood-related. Yeah. Um, or even if it's just, like, I want to get home to my dog and I know you're not going to. It's, like, yeah. how do we how do we overcome that? Or I miss oh my goodness like I'm missing my son's graduation or I'm missing my own graduation because I'm in yeah. the hospital I feel like that's the bad part mm. that's kind of okay. ugly too to be honest yeah. but I feel like the ugly is like almost a lack of ability to do stuff and I know it's not always just the hospital system sometimes it's just life yeah. but there's sometimes in the hospital system where I'm like we could be doing a lot more with this person or there's mm. there should be more options as far and like some people prefer to be unhoused and that's do your thing but yeah. that's cool but these people yeah. that are working or are on disability and they can't access the health the medicine that they need they can't access the housing like if they just had those or they don't feel like they have equal health care mm. or equal education or yeah. the health literacy part it's like that's ugly because that's yeah. on us like yeah. what are we not doing to make sure that everyone feels like they have the equal access and opportunity to health care that they're going to be treated the same and like not everyone's going to have the same outcome yeah but like that everyone has the same chance yeah it'll, it, it'll, yeah <laughs> it'll, yeah it'll enable them like puts people on like an equal playing field somewhat exactly awesome. but okay. it's like you know people have more status than others more money or yeah. race or religion or like whatever it is the fact that that can have an influence on healthcare is ugly. Yeah. That's my yeah. ugly part. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. It's true. Okay, I like yeah. it. Uh this 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 question, uh <laughs> are you are you um underpaid or overpaid as a doctor? Look, I'm gonna <laughs> say Well, okay, so but I think like my it's like a, a doctor in the rehab setting. Okay. Um and so I'm still advocating for what 
OT is in a lot of spaces. Mm -hmm. So OT workplace people, people um, kind of value OT more. Mm -hmm. I would say they're rightfully paid. Like things yeah. like that. There's travel positions, which is great, but I feel like in the acute setting, um, probably underpaid um, and a mm -hmm. lot of places that don't value OT as much. Uh, the hospital is definitely growing. And I think that this is more of a hospital where it's like, hey, like, we we know we're the best, so we can just tell you when you want to be here. And that's valid. <laughs> like, because yeah. I do, you got me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. But there are more, like, private settings where you get paid more. And I feel like that's valid for any doctor, like yeah. any healthcare profession. Yeah. Is, like, just where you are. So it's kind of just, like, underpaid financially, but mm. education-wise, I've been very very thankful to learn more than i ever thought that i would know about I love it. or healthcare or people so <laughs> i love it i love it yeah, knowledge is worth that. more than riches um thank you exactly <laughs> what, <laughs> what is one person book or event that changed your life for like positive my grandpa <laughs> okay nice oh my gosh I'm sorry. Literally, my dog is snoring under my table. <laughs> <laughs> I'm weak. Can I can't even hear him. I can't even hear him. I don't think I can. Uh, can you hear <laughs> I, don't, oh I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Maybe, I might be able to, like, once I, like, like maybe when I edit, maybe a little bit, I can't. She does, like, this whistle snore. I'm like, right now. <laughs> and you have a, you have a um, golden doodle, right? Is it golden doodle? She is, she's, like, a mix of a doodle retriever and apparently, like, an Irish wolfhound. I got it from the shelter. Um, so she's like a little bit of everything but okay. she's an old lady so she loves her little <laughs> evening naps but we have kickball soon so she's gonna have to wake up <laughs> oh um, but i would say my grandpa 100 percent. like um he's not with us anymore but he as as long as i remember was always like one help other people to smile every day and it's like if you're not smiling he would always come and look in the mirror, but he was always like, do whatever you can to make sure that somebody else is happy because at the end of the day, I mean, that helps you like in a selfish yeah. way, like giving can be selfish, but at the same yeah. time, like you're helping other people. But, um, from that instance, but then also, um, when I started going into healthcare, when he got sick with dementia, like I, that was one of the hardest things I've ever been through was to see somebody that I love so close, almost turn into a different person. I mean, he was mm. always who he was at heart, but yeah. you know, dementia plays a big part in your brain and the way that yeah. you react to things um and i don't th i think without that perspective i wouldn't be able to provide as much empathy as i do for my patients now mm -hmm. um so nice. as tough as that was to go through like i'm very very thankful um that one he passed when he did and he didn't suffer with dementia too long but it gave me an insight to like how other people um feel yeah. um, but then i have so many patients that have just like taken my heart <laughs> mm -hmm. um through the years but even before like i took a gap year when i was like, taking care of my grandpa and like, um okay. i had patients at a neuro center that i like still keep in contact with and hang out with and mm -hmm. um i feel like everyone everyone's put in your life for a reason yeah, um definitely. and yeah but i would say the one that stands out the most is my grandpa i love it rest in peace grandpa rest last <laughs> last question let's say we have like a, a young lady or man watching this episode and they just want like some tips or advice in becoming like becoming a doctor of occupational therapy what are like some tips or some advice that you get them to get like on the right path not necessarily the right path but to maybe yeah. accelerate their path and be a little more I think that's, a, that's a good question i think that it's so specific to each person in a way um because it depends like do you want to get your master's or do you want to do a doctorate look at research um what kind of ot do you want to do and it's like kind of what programs are near you but i mean i think i think that's a very good broad program it's just like if you're willing to advocate you can do a lot more i feel like that's what i'm learning now is that i really have to advocate for the profession and like educate on it so just kind of knowing ahead of time like that's a part of it but also using your resources like if you are to go to ot school um one reach out to me anytime i'm sure yeah. my information will be somewhere with yeah. this podcast please Definitely. i would love to like mentor reach out or if you're in the baltimore area come yeah. shadow with me at hopkins but yeah learn as much as you can um network i feel like is a big thing will i feel like you're fantastic with this but <laughs> um i feel like my goal recently has been to reach out as many people as i can set up meetings mm -hmm. and just learn yeah. um if it's for you it's for you if it's not that's okay 
Yeah. Cool. Keep it moving. Um, but if you want to do it, then stick with it. Find out if you want to do master's doctorate. And then through that, take advantage of every opportunity to learn what kind of setting you want to be in. And if you don't, like me, try every setting. Yeah. <laughs> do yeah. what you like. Do Honestly. OT or don't do OT, but you have the degree. So. Yeah. 100%. I love it. This has, been, this has been an amazing episode. Dr. Lewis, man, we really appreciate you coming on here tonight. Thank you. Um, if people want to, re- want to reach out to you, where can they, where can they um, like go to? Um, I'm not like a huge social media person, but um, I would say my Instagram, I want to say, oh my God, I made it like middle school. Mackenzie, M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E, 0425. Um, birthday. Uh, yeah, please send me DM anything, anything about OT, um, healthcare. Even if I don't know, I can put you in contact with somebody because I love to talk. So I'll find somebody <laughs> that knows the quick answer. <laughs> Perfect. We love it. And I'll, I'll put the Instagram in the uh, link, the thumbnail too, under the link uh, at the bottom so people can just click okay. on it. So Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you again. I hope everyone learned a lot. I know I learned a lot about um, the healthcare <laughs> system occupational therapy in general. Um, Thank you again. Y'all have a nice night.